<sighs> Man, Tuesday. Today is Tuesday, August 6th. So Damien, what's on your mind this week? On my mind today are two stories uh, that are making me think uh, about the porousness of borders, uh, but not in the way that you're probably thinking about. Okay, the porousness of borders. So the first story is this excellent sort of like new media story in the Washington Post by Nick Miroff and one other journalist. Uh, and what it shows is that there has been a tremendous uptick of mainland China migrants coming in through Mexico. And what's unique about this wave is number one, they're asking for asylum, which is unusual because these people have to come from China down to South America and up to the border, um, US border, US Mexico border, but also they're middle class migrants. Okay. And that, that is really, really unusual. And to me, almost unbelievable, but it's undeniable because you see the numbers, you see the video footage. What's happening just briefly is that uh, these middle class migrants are using this new generation of apps. One of the platforms is the short video app Douyin, the Chinese counterpart of TikTok. To get to the United States, to get to very specific entry points. And these apps, as you can see in, in the video footage uh, presented in the Washington Post story, show uh, very detailed directions uh, of like the Dorian Gap, which we've talked about on this channel before, that passage uh, from South America to Panama and to, and to you know, Central America. They show very uh, detailed photos about what color money you want to spend on different parts of your journey so you know how much you're spending. They tell you who to talk to, uh, even what smugglers to contact, and it's all there, just so, like publicly available on these Chinese language apps. Can I ask you a question about yeah. the apps? Are yeah. they a three-day or a seven-day free trial? <laughs> well, hopefully, nobody's making that trip in seven days. Nobody's making that trip in seven days. You're talking about a th at least a 30-day trip, and these folks are showing up mostly in San Diego and a few places um, in Arizona, and uh, they're going to like particular parking lots that, again, have been highlighted on the apps. Not anything special about these lots, but they've become special just by the sheer number of people coming through them. And they're asking for asylum and they're getting work permits and they're setting up in two places mainly. One is in California and the other is in Flushing, New York. And these are just to be, to be clear, mostly, if not entirely uh, native Mandarin speakers, as opposed to what you might be thinking of like Cantonese migrants. This was really strange. Uh, I lived in China uh, for a long time. So from August 2007 to September 2009, um, I lived in China in one big stretch. And then from 2014 to 2016, I lived there in multiple like semi-long stretches as a consultant. And I was going in and out of the country and visiting all sorts of towns and cities. And I did a master's in Chinese studies. Okay, so a lot of my life, a lot of my 20s and teens were focused on Chinese language study and just trying to understand this big old country. So. In 2007, you have to understand, China was the most optimistic place in the entire world. The economy was rocking. The GDP was going up, up, up. Real estate was appreciating at 30% year on year. Millions, tens of millions, dare I say hundreds of millions of people were getting rich or richer. And the number of people living on a dollar a day or less uh, almost disappeared. China had become the new miracle of Asia following the trajectory of Korea, Taiwan, Japan. But China did it with a population of 1.5 billion people. And on our side of the ocean, China's rise gave, gave, uh, gave us reasons to be fearful in a way, even though the cost of our goods all dropped tremendously. Suddenly, you know, you could buy shirts at Walmart for like $5. Uh, the competition from Chinese manufacturing was very real and it hollowed out many of our cities and towns and it became, as, as we're very well aware now, a, a, political, uh, a political kindling uh, for particularly for far-right rhetoric, even though that's not correct today because uh, now uh, we've decoupled from China, haven't we? But in 2007, we hadn't decoupled. In fact, we were looking to couple more. China was borrowing lots of our dollars, sending us lots of cheap goods. We were sending them a lot of foreign investment. I myself went to China thinking, hey, I can make a career here. Maybe I can stay here. And I wasn't alone. There were many thousands of people, maybe millions of people, I don't know, trying to move and make, make, make a life in China. If I had asked 
a middle-class Chinese then, so somebody working in the service sector or working in a factory or transitioning out of a factory, maybe had some you know, university education, if they would ever consider getting on a plane from China, going to a visa-free country for them, uh, for, for Chinese nationals, making their way to Mexico, and then crossing across the U.S. border to ask for asylum, they would have looked at me like I was insane. They would have said, this is a crazy American propagandist in our midst. Why the heck will we leave China? My standard of living has doubled every year for the past 25 years. We're the most open country on the planet. We have all the television you have, all, you know, our satellite, we have 300 satellite channels. We have all the social media you have. Look at these cars. There's $300,000 cars on the street in Beijing everywhere you look. And this is true. In 2007, there were more $300,000 cars in Beijing and Shanghai than anywhere else on earth. And you know what? On reflection upon getting home that day after getting thoroughly, you know, spanked and beat up by Chinese locals for having such a crazy take, I would have said, you know, that was a crazy question. Why would I ever want to, as a Chinese person, to leave this, this, this uh, megalopolis, this, this hive of activity. But something changed, okay? From 2007 to 2016, something in China changed. Now, the Washington Post story points to COVID as a key factor. The COVID lockdowns led to a lot of people losing their businesses, losing their livelihoods. The economy didn't recover and save these middle-class Chinese coming to the U.S. to look for better opportunities. No and then! No and then! No and then! But I would argue change starts, things started changing a lot earlier. Okay, so here's a little insight. I first reported to colleagues the presence of an increased presence of Chinese migrants to the United States around 2017. That's when I first started working in detention centers. And as the only Mandarin Chinese speaker on staff, what was usually staffed by Spanish speakers, maybe Haitian Creole speakers, um, I got tasked with speaking with the Chinese migrants. And they were coming on these really suspicious routes where they would all take a plane out of Beijing, come to Mexicali, go to the border, ask for asylum on the basis of religious persecution. And the really curious thing is that none of them said they needed a lawyer because they were already lawyered up with somebody who they didn't want to disclose. And my working assumption to this day is that that was some form of advanced labor trafficking for these working age males. And inevitably, they would get out of detention, uh, which was not true for other people that we were representing. Now, this was still curious to me, and it still made sense because this was from an area where you traditionally had a lot of people leaving China, which is Fujian province, for lots of historical reasons we need to go into. But something had also started changing because it meant to me that what I had been seeing previous on my business trips to China 2014, 2016, was not a mirage. And what I had been seeing was a slowdown in the Chinese economy. So people who follow China for a long time know that several things were happening at once. Number one, China was kind of reaching the peak of its ability to create wealth out of the construction of new real estate. Okay, so one of the primary ways that the state at the province level, uh, so provincial governments created wealth for their citizens was by pouring, getting, borrowing lots of money from a central bank, which like the U.S. can print its own money, and then pouring it into concrete, essentially. That concrete would provide uh, opportunities for ownership for citizens. The apartments would be built, not very well a lot of the time, right, or the office building would be built, and somehow uh, value will be created for a lot of folks, you know, and not to mention the offshoot value created by the construction of those buildings, the sourcing the materials, and for the government, crucially, the selling of the land. The government earns money on land once, it's when they sell it, they don't do a tax year on year like we do here, they don't do a property tax. And so that was slowing down because there's only so much stuff you can build before you've reached capacity, and arguably China probably reached capacity in the 2000s. So by the 2010s, they're building more and more and you start to get reports of these ghost cities, cities with tens of thousands of units just sitting empty, in fact entire streets just empty. And we noticed the economy slowing down and my first thing, this is kind of silly and you probably won't understand what I'm saying unless you've lived in a big Chinese city, but we saw stores shuttering on the third ring road of Beijing. Beijing has a series of circular loops around it that emanate uh, from the central emperor's palace, last occupied in the Qing dynasty, right? 
uh, next to Tiananmen Square. And the third ring road is still like in the center of the city. You got the fourth ring, fifth ring, sixth ring road. And the fact that shops were closing there meant that something really odd was happening because shops shouldn't be closing in a city that on its worst day has 25 million people. But when you count the undocumented internal migrants, it's probably closer to 35, you know? They shouldn't be closing unless people already prone to saving a lot more than US consumers, Western consumers were saving even more because they were seeing something. And indeed, the real estate had been slowing down, so that wealth engine was slowing down. Xi Jinping had come to power, and Xi Jinping had instituted, uh, in the beginning, what he called anti-corruption measures to reduce the spending of cadres on lavish gifts to themselves and those who were connected to them. And then he started doing something else entirely, which is withdrawing China from its international relationships in order to assert China as a power equal to the United States on the national stage. And I mean, we all saw this unfold in real time. Trump comes to power. He puts on tariffs on China. China puts on tariffs on US goods. And since that time, over the past eight years, what we've seen is a decoupling. So there's fewer Chinese international students, many fewer in US universities than before. Um, COVID shut down entirely trips to China. Uh, tourism between the two countries is way down. And overall, we have decoupled in a way uh, that we are now something that we couldn't recognize in 2007. And it's this context, a slowing economy, decoupling from the United States. Then COVID comes on top of that and the Author strong authoritarian streak of Xi Jinping really starts to shine. So all these social credit scores and things we haven't talked about yet, um, show a lot of people that they truly are oppressed, but worse than that, they've lost ways to make money because the economy ground to a halt. Because there's no foreign investment due to that decoupling which started in 2016, uh, there's no easy way to get that engine going again. And because people are, have a predilection to save in China anyway, um, they are more hesitant than ever to become the consumers that China's already need, always needed to try and maintain its forward pace, but consumers that they never gotten and perhaps never will because of the aforementioned authoritarian tendencies. So now in 2024, for the first time, we have a quote unquote migration problem with the Chinese middle class who are coming to the United States because China's downturn, which is caused by the decoupling of the US and China and the slowing down of its economy. So there's this idea that like borders and countries, are, you know, they, the country does its thing and the people, you know, stay in that country and they don't think beyond it. But in the world of the internet and the world of the handheld super app, which shows you every day the possibilities of new places and critically now gives you detailed instructions about how to enter those new places, borders don't matter. And arguably, Borders are, very, are always going to be hard to control because the technology is ahead of your ability as a country to lay down a wall. Trump couldn't do it in four years, right? It took Biden three and a half years to come up with a sound policy that would reduce entries at the border because he had to gather the political will. So what we're left with in these um, porous borders is, is with the conundrum of like, what, what could be done to stop this? And what's actually needed is stronger diplomatic ties with China and a recognition that decoupling itself is a fantasy. You can no longer decouple. You can't isolate yourself within the borders on a map. We have to interact with the world because if we don't, the world will come to us with their problems and it's gonna be harder to solve that than it would have been to interact with the world and prevent those problems in the first place. What I'm calling for is a stronger diplomatic policy and stronger engagement with the world, not a pulling in. So in a way, it seems paradoxical, but it's really not. If you wanna solve the immigration problem at the southern border and the immigration problems that are at the northern border that are less talked about, where a lot of people are entering the country, right? Uh, seeking asylum, not seeking these other official ways to enter, even though asylum is an official way to enter. Well, guess what? You need to engage with those countries. We have to become global citizens even more than we are in this very, very, very mixed heterogeneous society. The, the other story that, that came up, and it's a sad one, it's a sad one, um, um, 
week in Southport, England, there was a stabbing um, at what seems like a summer resort school type thing, dance school, six to 11 year old girls were practicing Taylor Swift songs, probably while their parents were on vacation. And a number of the girls were killed um, by a 17 year old. And it, it's sad for me because one of the girls looks exactly like my six year old daughter. And like, you know, it just kind of stops your world. Uh, and I live in a summer, summer town of sorts on the water. You know, like it hits close to home for me, but the the 17-year-old Salem was a UK citizen. He was the son of Rwandan. Looks like um, I don't know if they're refugees or they 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 moved. Looks like to England. His parents a year, at least a year or so, after the Rwandan genocide. And by all reports, were great people. You know, newspapers say they're great people. Mom worked at home. Dad worked when every day to work. They had a hatchback, whatever. What, they had a hatchback? That can't be. I mean, they're, they're boring, right? They're, that's well, a sign I, of a boring... That's a signal of... of, of... <laughs> that's a signal of modesty. Okay. It's a modesty. Yeah, you're right. That's a good question, right? That's what the report said, right? Okay, okay. Yeah, hatchback, yeah. yeah. Modesty, I don't know, modesty. Yeah, maybe they like the environment. Maybe they're liberal. I don't, I don't know. It signals something there, right? Interesting. <laughs> the optics, as we like to say, that euphemism for the way things look uh, to people when uh, looked at in an unfiltered way, in a non-rational way, is that um, a black man whose parents came and were allowed into England from Rwanda has killed uh, English white children. You would also point out one of the children killed definitely had a Latino last name and face, you know, but the optics are gonna be a black man killed white children and I expect, as this has been happening all week, that this will become a major, uh, major cause celebre of uh, the anti-immigrant movement in the UK. But I want to point out something. Right? Um, the Rwandan genocide, which cost the lives of 800,000 people in a record 60 days or so, it's the fastest genocide. 16? 60. 60 with machetes, right? It has an uncomfortable callback to what happened in Southport. That was uncomfortably, uh, if you trace the history back, it, it traces back to a history of English colonialism, dividing the Rwandan people into Hutus and Tutsis, which metastasizes in 1994 into a hate campaign that leads to mass death. And, um, the lack of early intervention uh, or intervention in, in, into what was clearly becoming a polarized, uh, violent state of affairs um, led to this genocide being carried out. The place where Rwanda comes into the news in UK today is, is there's, before this attack was one place. It was in the deportation policy that the UK Conservative Party had suggested under, under uh, what's his name, Boris? Johnson. Johnson, under Boris Johnson, which was to deport everybody that came by sea illegally into England to Rwanda. Rwanda would be paid to take on these refugees, okay? So there's a, there's a powerful set of visuals set of audio cues in this story. But the only way to untangle it is that England too is gonna to have to reckon with this horrible act. It's gonna to have to carry out justice against the perpetrator. Um, that community is gonna to have to try to heal. Those families will never heal. They will never heal. Healing is a myth for many people. You can't heal from that. But the only way to um, bring some sort of um, peace to these types of conflicts is again to have to engage with the world. The wrong reaction to this would be, we should have never let in the Rwandans. We should have never let in people of color. We need to kick them all out and keep our communities safe because that's not what's gonna keep our communities safe. What's gonna keep the community safe is the ability of countries, the UK included, 
to interact with countries all around the world and to try to find communal solutions to what are really, really real problems of movement. And that's going to have to be separated in people's minds from what are some of the other probably indirect or proximate causes of this tragedy, including access to mental health, racial tensions, racial frustrations, um, and access to weapons. Okay. And I say that knowing that I'm not offering um, a clear solution because I'm as dumbfounded as everybody watching this. But my major fear is that this again becomes a cause celebre that's going to lead to further violence and death and a very, very strong reaction from nativists and from the far right. And it's going to be wrong headed because ultimately, again, borders are porous. And what we are always left with is the decision to be more diplomatic with those in other countries and be diplomats for our own families, our own psyches with everybody around us in heterogeneous societies. It's hard to do. It can be heartbreaking to do. When you lose your children, it can be infuriating to do because you want to look and locate an identity that you can blame. But I hope that, um, I hope that we don't do that this time. So that's what's on my mind.